this section is going to talk about class reconciliation within the church and um, different models of that. So in some of that is thinking about how are different organizations, and I'm particularly taking an organizational perspective, partly because the next section is going to talk about how we might think about class and tech mission and what kind of is our strategy, how do we relate to the different models out there. Um, a lot of this model stuff is fairly heady, so I apologize in advance, but there's a lot of information. Um, and I think I'm going to try to go through this stuff fairly quick because I want to focus more on this, the other section. Um, in the previous section, we talked about the three options biblically for churches in handling class. So one is to be a lower class dominant church. Second is to be a multi-class church and to actually do that genuinely with where power is shared. And the third is to be a middle or upper class giving church. Um, and what I want to do is talk about different models. Um, can somebody focus the thingy? Can you focus that? That's fine. That's fine. So there's a lot of different church models that are out there. So part of part of what I'm going to talk about is very strong models within the body of Christ of groups that are addressing the needs of lower classes. Um, so there's a lot of different approaches towards that. And what I've tried to do is to take some selective examples that represent um, kind of common a approaches. So although this isn't exhaustive, um, probably the most, the kind of widest movement um, for the lower classes is Pentecostalism in the past. Hundred years, there's been over a billion new Christians that are, as a part of the global Pentecostal remo renewal movement. That's including people who would call themselves Pentecostals and people who would be in very strong Holy Spirit denominations or um, in charismatic um, circles. Um, and part of what's I think helpful is to understand what is the unique role for each of, of these organizational models and. Um, part of it is we can think about how do we as a group fit into that and then how do we individually fit into that. So I think what Pentecostals do well is that they are a church that's culturally of the poor. Um, I, I think that what Pentecostals do is they try to meet the people kind of where their culture is and they're actually fighting much more of a cultural battle. Um, the class background, so what I've done for each of these is gone through what is the class background, what's the class identification, what's the class access, and what's the class consciousness um, for each of these movements. So it's a ministry of the poor. So there's kind of these different classifications that you can use. Ministry of the poor, ministry with the poor, and ministry to the poor. Um, and to a certain extent, those correspond to the three options biblically for churches. Uh, ministry of the poor, lower class dominant church, ministry with the poor, multi-class church, and ministry to the poor, which is being the upper class, middle or upper class giving church. Um, so Pentecostalism is a ministry of the poor, and I would say that the church culture most strongly fits with the class culture of the poor. Um, and you know, one of the interesting things that, that uh, people who've studied different church movements around the world have, have said is that there's a lot of groups out there that they're claiming to be work for the poor, you know, whether it's Marxist or um, a lot of other groups that claim to be for the poor, but generally the poor have, for the most part, self-selected towards Pentecostalism. It's just, I think part of that is because Pentecostalism is closest culturally. Um, in terms of class identification... In that setting, well, if they are, you're saying that creating self-selection of the poor into Pentecostalism. Yeah, exactly. C creating self-selection of the poor into Pentecostalism. Um, in terms of class identification, um, Pentecostalism, what, what's interesting is that most movements that identify with the poor, they often don't do it overtly or consciously. What Pentecostalism does is they, like if you're familiar with Pentecostal denominations, one thing that Pentecostals are very into, they're very into self-education, educating within Pentecostal seminary 
ways or Pentecostal um, teaching or actually doing it in, in practice. Um, and some of the criticism people have had of Pentecostalism is Pentecostal sometimes can be resistant towards people going into higher education in general. Um, and I think that what a lot of people don't realize is that the reason for that resistance, I think, you know, Pentecostals will put it in terms of becoming worldly, but I think a part of what they're saying is you're going to class assimilate if you go into these institutions, that that's their function. Um, so there's two ways that Pentecostals maintain lower class identification. One is control over education to avoid class assimilation. Um, the other is raising up leadership from within and not having policies like you have to have a degree, you know. The guy who can pray for people and make it healed, he becomes a pastor generally, you know, the Pentecostal church. Um, so, um, yeah, it could be a, a third separate bullet. Is there an extra copy of this? Okay. All right, one of our weapons. Um, in terms of class access, Pentecostals in general have very low access to the upper classes. Um, and part of what's unique about Pentecostals is, is they're financially dependent on the lower classes. So what that does, there's a lot of class reconciling movements that are actually financially dependent on the upper classes. And that significantly affects what you can do. Um, but because Pentecostalism is financially dependent on the lower classes, that gives it a unique role. And yeah, I think I already covered this. It somewhat promotes gaining class access to individuals, but there's a distrust of the spiritual effects of being assimilated um, or experiencing classism in the educational institution. Um, although it's not often explained in those terms, it's often just explained in the spiritual terms. And the class consciousness, Pentecostals aren't class conscious in general. Um, they aren't the type that are thinking about, you know, liberation theology generally. And, and they're actually kind of at opposite poles from the liberation theology people. So, does all this make sense? So, the next role is looking at the Salvation Army and this also could be gospel rescue missions, it could be a lot of large national Christian nonprofits. So I'd say Salvation Army is representative of any large nonprofit. Um, and there the role is ministry with the poor and to try to get resources to the poorest. Um, and if you look at the class background, um, it's ministry with the poor Salvation Army. It, a lot of people are coming from low-income backgrounds. It may be, um, have, have a lot of white folks, but it's often people from, from lower-income backgrounds. Um, and a lot of their focus is on transferring resources to the poor. Um, in terms of identification, they're fairly similar to Pentecostals, where they have strong control over um, education to avoid class assimilation and raise up leadership from within. Um, with, so. I would say where they're most different from Pentecostals is that the Salvation Army has amazing access into the upper classes. So, um, you know, early in the history of the Salvation Army, they would get, you know, the richest people in New York City to fund their different campaigns and different things like that. And the Salvation Army is um, often among, you know, they're always among the top ten nonprofits in the country, but often among the top five and, um, in terms of fundraising. So they, they're they also similar to Pentecostals in that they somewhat promote gaining class access to individuals, but are, are concerned about kind of losing class identification in that process. Um, the Salvation Army, like Pentecostals, um, they don't promote class consciousness. And part of what's interesting about this is the Salvation Army, they're serving a population that is not just the poor, but it's often the poorest. And it, it, it's, you know, if you're talking about a homeless population, you're not going to get a self-supporting homeless population where you're going to be able to fund the buildings, and you're going to be able to fund, um, you know, the preachers or whatever from the homeless. You know, if you pass around the offering plate with the homeless, you're not going to get like a, a big contribution. Um, so it's almost required 
if you're if you're going to be going for the poorest, which that's what I've kind of emphasized, that you have to be able to get access to some of the upper class resources, if that makes sense. Um, another category is urban black churches, and here I'm, I'm talking about primarily um, black churches that are um, either multi-class or um, lower class identified. I would say this stands as a placeholder for all ethnic churches that have either multi-class or lower class identified. Um, within, Maybe you should probably say that. Yeah, well, I'm saying it verbally. <laughs> so, um, in terms of class background, it could be ministry of the poor, ministry with the poor, ministry to the poor, depending on the type of church, um, whether it's multi-class, whether it's uh, lower class dominant. Um, but the mission focus is that it's on the urban black community. Um, and because the urban black community, because of historic racism, um, there's often a strong class component um, to that that's inherent focus. Um, in terms of class identity, um, often maintaining racial identity will maintain class identification if it's in lower class dominant churches. So if you're in a lower class dominant church and people talk about what does it mean to be black, generally they're talking about being black, lower class identified. I don't know that that's always true in the upper class black churches. There might be a different model for what it means to be black. Um, and I think that uh, there's also some distrust of um, classes or racist institutions and how that might affect assimilation. Um, class access is different from other groups in that there is a, I would say in most ethnic groups, there's a um, strong upwardly mobile class access, you know, get education, get education um, type of thing. Um, there's financial, and I mean there's financial dependence on the middle and upper class black community or ethnic community if it's a different community. Um, and consciousness, I would say, okay, you're not, you're not tracking, how are other people doing? Am I going a little too fast? Okay, sir. Um, on class consciousness, there's a strong promotion of racial awareness, but may not strongly promote a distinct class consciousness depending on the type of church. You know, if it's a middle and upper class church, there may be a different level there. So this is kind of my assessment, but I recognize it's looking from an outsider, although I've been in black churches for a good part of my life. Um, I don't know how other people would feel, feel about this analysis, whether this is fair. I would say just the same way the huge difference between Bethel and global and Jewelry versus historical global light or the most kids right here. I'm not sure what those differences are, but they both would be colored in my churches. Great. And you know, I, mean, I, I don't know to what extent you could say that global I mean on jewelry Christian colors before. Right. I mean, I was, I was, I would say that's true about Bethel. To some extent, although that's not who's there. So I yeah. Think that even though they're urban, they may still be upper class. Right. Yeah. And I could have put middle upper class, and maybe I should put that as you know, use the terms middle upper class or lower class black churches. But I didn't want. I guess either way I represent it, because I think there are middle class black churches that are multi-class and that there's actually sharing of power. Um, so that, I think that was the reason why I didn't put it in there, is I didn't want to say if you're a middle class black church then you aren't identifying with the poor entirely, you know what I'm saying? So that, that was the reason why I did it. <laughs> Other people have thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I think it's worth talking about all the distinct points between, you know, there are middle class black churches that do 
identify with the poor, there are middle class black churches that don't. So I think that, you know, yeah, so. But recognizing that in the U.S., that's a major, I mean, there are, you know, tens of thousands of black churches that are doing this. That's part of why I focus on black churches as a model, um, although there could be other groups that fit in. Um, the next one is looking at Latin American liberation theology. So this is like the base communities, for those of you who are familiar um, with that. And there, the unique role is primarily political, where you're trying to change political systems of exploitation. Um, this would also be, you know, any group that is that their primary focus is changing political systems of exploitation. I would say this is a placeholder for for those. Um, so there's been a lot of Marxist Christians in the past and things like that. They would fall into this category. Class background, I would say, in general, for these movements, it's ministry to the poor and ministry with the poor. Um, are you are you making a distinction between Latin American churches and the United States and in Latin America? I'm focusing on in Latin America because the strongest Latin American liberation theology churches are mostly in Latin America. Right, and I would say they're, I would say they're more of the poor and with the poor than to the poor. But, um, is that true in the Catholic community? Yes. It is? Okay. I've, what I've read about them, that's the primary criticism of the Catholic community, is that the leadership is upper class. Okay, I see what you're saying. No, I'm talking about the actual congregation. Of yeah, the yeah, I'm talking about, I think that's what defines whether it's to, with, or of. So, you're, so that part too, with our audience, you're talking about the leadership. Right. Okay, I didn't realize that. I thought you were talking about the congregation. No, I think it, it, it's where is the power health okay. is what I'm getting at. It would be helpful to have you say that in the slide. Okay, sure. Because now I, I didn't feel that. Okay. Do you want to look to the poor and the poor? Right. So how so you're talking about this book in the Catholic and non-Catholic context? Yeah, although it's my understanding that liberation theology is much stronger in the Catholic context, but it may vary from country to country. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, do you have any other comments on that or? Still, okay, you're still digesting. Still okay. the first line, so part of part of one of the quotes that I've read and heard many times is that liberation theology people are kind of baffled because they say we're for the poor because politically they're for the poor, but the poor choose other churches. Like in Latin America, that's kind of the summary of what's happening in terms of church transition. And I think that part of that is that lower classes are self-selecting towards Pentecostalism because of a closer fit to culture. Um, and the mission is to focus on changing systems that perpetuate poverty. So, was that? It's very political. Yeah, very political. Um, so, in terms of class identification, there's a very strong theology to maintain class identification. So unlike other groups there, where class identification is done in subtle ways, like how you educate people and how leaders are selected, liberation theology, class identification is explicit, um, if that makes sense. Does that make sense to people? Um, I mean, it, yeah, I'll talk about that a little more later. In class, class access, there generally within the Catholic Church there's a strong level of access to the upper classes um, to affect political systems um, but there can be financial dis- dependence on the upper classes um, through the Catholic Church so 
and part of this is if you look at you know the Catholic Church in Latin America, it has access to political resources. And any group that I, I would say is high access and is class aware, this is a, a very significant role that this group can play. And I, I'd say for some of us here, it's something to think about. If you're if you're if you have high access and you're class aware, then that generally is the group that's going to be playing a role politically, if that makes sense. So, um, but part of the criticism of liberation theology is that the language is more, and this is the Latin American liberation theology, is the, the language is often in the upper and middle class language. It's much more of an academic thing, and it addresses addresses the concerns of the academics and that, you know, the middle and upper classes pay attention to it because it's in their language. Um, and class consciousness, unlike other groups, I would say it's the most class conscious and that that's what makes it different. So they're very class conscious. Um, so kind of like within the black church, you know, the challenge of are you black or not, you know, is like a challenge that's kind of pervasive or whatever within um, Latin American liberation theology, as I understand it, is are you identifying with the poor or are you sold out? And so. Another group that I probably know the least about, but I've read different aspects in history, is the church-based workers' movement. So this would be like Christian labor movements. Um, and there the primary role is changing economic systems of exploitation um, and the mission. So the class background is to address, well this is more the mission, to address the economic issues for the working class, which typically will be working class. I probably should have put that in there. Let me myself a note. Um, the class identification like if you look at unions and the way unions work, I mean, this is this could be a placeholder for all unions to a certain extent. The class identification is done through strong control over education to avoid class assimilation within unions. It's a really big deal to educate within the union um, and to have control over the educational process because if you don't, class assimilation happens. Um, and there's often promoting language, dress, and culture of the working class to maintain class identity. So, you know, if you go to a, a labor meeting, you aren't seeing everyone sitting in suits, you know, trying to identify with the upper classes. Um, there's a, a, a either conscious or unconscious outward identification with the working class. Um, the class access, the movements are often led by middle class, but it's often middle class, working class, if that makes sense. Um, but they make their maintain their class identification with the working class and poor. Um, and generally they don't promote mobility out of blue collar jobs. So you can move up in access within blue collar jobs, but if you move out of the blue collar world, then you're selling out. Um, and class consciousness is very strong. So any comments or questions on that one? So where is the church-based work? Well, it's, it's my understanding that the solidarity movement in Poland was largely church-based. So, and that's what overthrew communism in Poland. Um, there's been a lot of, if I remember right, Korea, I think, had really strong um, worker movement that was a, a lot of establishing the credibility of Christians in Korea and people have said that that's been a lot of the reason why revival broke out there is because um, in terms of fighting for justice um, Christians were at the forefront of that for quite a while and established themselves as kind of defender for justice and that, that allowed for a lot of the country like Korea, some of the songs, the most Christian country in the world or something like that. I think there's a few countries that are always vying for it, but um, South Korea, um, yeah. And I think that that's a lot of the reason for it. Um, but I need to look up, I don't, I don't have references, but those are the two that come from memory. Um, but I need to look up references for those. South Africa. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Was he, Tutu, was he a labor guy? I'm not sure either. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure either. But it was a lower class right. situation. Yeah, he, he was he was Catholic, so I think he might have been closer to liberation theology. Okay. Um, so 
So here's kind of a summary of the lessons from this category. And, and part of what's helpful is, and part of the reason why I looked at this was to understand why are these movements making the choices that they make. And I think the, the biggest summary is you have to recognize what's your unique role as an organization and as a person. Part, part of what I think is helpful is you can transpose each of these to people. You know, you could say, I'm uh, whatever, let's find, you know, I have high access, not very class conscious, I have strong class identification, and I have a lower class background. Okay, so th these different things, I think, translate into ways that you can think about, okay, here's some here's a group of people who have this mixture and what role they're playing. And like uh, people who are most often involved in liberation theology, they're class conscious and they have high access. So if you're high access and you have class con strong class consciousness, then there's a significant role for you politically, if that makes sense. Or there could be. Um, so in terms of lessons, um, in terms of class background, lower classes generally self-select groups that fit their culture. Um, cultural fit is more important than being politically or even economically for the poor. Um, another lesson is lower class identification is often done through organizational structures and culture. So leadership selection and education are the primary two. Um, then through an individual process. So. And let me just explain that a little more. There's an individual process of I'm individually going to choose to identify with the poor. And I'm going to go through, I'm going to try to live in the low income community, I'm going to try to hang out with, you know, basically be immersed in the low income community, I'm going to be very intentional individually. That's one way of approaching it. And that's often, I would say, the way in a varsity and a lot of, you know, the, the three R's, CCDA, relocate, um, approaches it. I think that there is another way, and that's to, to actually change it within the system so that you're educating people and you are um, doing leadership selection to create a lower class dominant, like a, a leadership structure that is identifying with, with the lower classes. Does that make sense? So that's, that's what I would say Salvation Army does. That's what, uh, what was the other group I was saying that did that? Uh, yeah, Pentecostalists do that. So class access, I think a lesson to learn from that is gaining that class access while maintaining class identification is difficult unless you manage the educational process. Because the educational process often is what determines class um, identification, if that makes sense. So I can't think of any large movements that don't have control over their own educational process where they gain access and identification, if that makes sense. Can you explain more specifically what you mean by education? So if you send people out to any college to go get educated, then they're going to go to that college, they're going to get immersed in a middle and upper class environment, and they're... She's talking about academic. Academic, yeah. And, and somewhat also, you know, pre-academic, like, I mean, pre, what is it, uh, post-secondary or whatever, college, pre-college, but I would say it's primarily a, a college academic education, yeah. Yeah, she probably put that in there. Mm -hmm. Is repeat the question that somebody asked you? Right. Yeah. I'll try to keep that in mind in the future. Um, class consciousness. So, so do people understand that point on class access? What? I'm not sure what you mean. When you say manage the educational practice, what does that mean? Um, okay, the question is, what does it look like to manage the educational process? It means to become an officer of the Salvation Army and go to Salvation Army training. Yeah, that, that's what it means to be a... The Salvation Army has a strong preference for people who go through their training. And they have a very extensive training 
um, that people have to go through. Same thing with Pentecostals in general. Um, yeah, so I, I'm talking about the, the, the post-secondary theological leadership development. Yeah. Right. Okay. The next part is on class consciousness. One thing that's really significant is that the political environment often won't tolerate class consciousness. So the best way to describe this is think about the McCarthyism era. If you're class conscious, generally you got labeled as a communist and you you experience significant oppression. So that's in the U.S. There's other environments where it's like that. I, the, at least my picture of where the U.S. is on class is it's kind of like, you know, why, why did it take a while for black consciousness to spread to the level that it's taken to now? You know, whenever the, the first leaders were really spreading black consciousness of Du Bois and others, before that time, if you were, I would say, had a strong black consciousness, you got killed. And it took someone who could get in an institution that would protect him or them um, to be able to be conscious and still make it, and then the consciousness could, could spread. And I think often the same type of thing happens on, on class. So it depends on what country you're in and how that country responds to class on whether it's actually safe to be class conscious. If that makes sense. Um, so you're saying... Oh, no. So part of what I'm saying is I think that there's been such suppression of class dialogue in the U.S. that we're at the very beginning of reforming a widespread class consciousness um, outside of, I would say, the labor movement within the U.S. So... Um, and then the other thing I was just going to say is class consciousness generally comes after access or once you gain access then you can afford to have class consciousness but if you're poor and militant then that's a challenge um, and that um, it, it can be hard to find employment it can be hard to um, basically make it in a society that doesn't like people who are class conscious or racially conscious, if that makes sense. Do you think, I mean, there, there's such real consciousness there, though, that how would you describe that consciousness? I mean, do you think, for somebody who's poor militant, they know they're poor, they know they're militant. Right, that's what I'm saying. So if you, if you gain consciousness before gaining access, then you become a poor militant and then it becomes much harder to gain access in the future. Does that make sense? Whereas if you, you gain access yeah. first, so say, say you get a college degree so and then you become conscious. I guess, I guess then I would really rephrase that last point because that's not communicating with you. What, how do you think it should be rephrased? Well, I think you should say what you just told me is just class consciousness before, when class consciousness comes before class access, it can be a deterrent to increase class access and class consciousness if you don't have it by the time you have class access you either won't have it at all or you are more likely to have it. Oh, uh, which doesn't make sense. But, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not this, is a, this is a very controversial point, especially I would say within the black community, it would be very, I'm, I'm saying it about class. I think it's very true about class. I don't know whether the same thing transfers about race, because I would, at least my understanding of the black community in general often will do consciousness before access. Um, right, because you use the voice as an example, but class consciousness, black class consciousness certainly preceded the voice. It didn't get to the white community for the voice. Right. Um, but the consciousness was way, way before him, but in terms of getting widespread, would you say it was widespread within the black community Certainly before? Okay. It was suppressed, um, but it was definitely widespread. But yeah. And then um, only access to it and access to it was gained through the black community. Right. Um, 
there was some space that was created for him, and then he began to publish a bit of accepted product right. in the community. Race consciousness certainly did. And then the strategy was because the race consciousness was first, using the race consciousness preceded the access, and then it was an intentional choice to gain access to further benefit those who were disenfranchised. So in using that model, conceivably caste consciousness could come first for as long as it to promote class access. Right, and you but class access for the purpose, not right. self yeah. but for right. okay. others. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I think what you're getting at is gaining consciousness before access helps the group, but it doesn't help the individual, I think is. No. I, I would say that that is true. I mean, we, 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 can, we can talk about that, but it, it, it helps the group if you're able to get a critical mass and then, like, progress, I guess is what I'm saying. So. I mean, I think it really depends because I think class con. I think it honestly depends right down to your immediate environment because yeah. class consciousness. I'm not talking about racial. I'm talking about class. I'm, yeah. I'm definitely not talking about racial. I totally agree. Right. I totally okay. agree. Like my family and we knew we were poor. We were poor, and that's why you went to college. Like that was the reason why you went to college because you were poor, not because. That's what, that, that's what you did, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and in your family, did you delineate yourself from the middle and the upper class Latinos significantly? You were trying to become a middle class that's, Yeah, that's the point of what I'm saying. So, class consciousness... It, I, I, I mean, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying you're trying to get access. Right. Not that you're trying to become... Well, it depends on what's going on right My mother's side, it was access in order to help. Mm. On my dad's side, it's access in order to forget, in order to move on to yeah. life and not be yeah. traumatized by your childhood. Yeah. Okay. So it really, and honestly, it depends. Yeah. Really. And I don't want to get too much into the racial consciousness because I think that there are differences in the racial consciousness because I think that what happened in the black community is you got a middle and upper class group that had racial consciousness and that was able to influence change. But I think that once you start to look at it through the class lens, I actually think that things do look a little different. So I'm not sure that the consciousness first actually applies, but we can have a much longer dialogue about that. Yeah, I feel like, especially not to I don't know about black people. I'm just talking about, I'm just talking from my perspective, mm -hmm. like for and I don't even know if this is true of like Mexican Americans, for example, who are in a slightly different category, or then some immigrant groups, some Latino immigrant groups. But at least in Colombia, you have class consciousness. You don't have racial consciousness to like. I you don't even, you even think of racial consciousness the way you think of here. So. So, so let me talk a little bit more about the class consciousness. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. or, or, or you finish yeah, your thought? Yeah, what, what I'm saying is like, for, for Colombia and Colombia, the predominant on, like, class comes before race or anything else, even before color. Right. Can you explain what you mean by class consciousness? Right. So whenever I talk about class consciousness, what I'm talking about is within a given ethnic group, so I guess there's two elements. Are you class identifying both within a given ethnic group and are you class identifying across ethnic groups? And I think to be class conscious you have to be able to do both of those. And I think that what that means is, for instance, so being class conscious in whatever ethnic group that, that you're a part of, say you're, you're a part of the labor movement with, within whatever ethnic group, you're going to take pride in the fact that you're working class. You're not upper class. You're not these other things. You're not middle class. You're working class. You're going to take pride in that. You're going to resist moving into those other classes to a certain extent. And um, you're very aware of what your class status is. Um, and you're going to identify across race with other working class people. Does that make sense? So, and I think so to be 
class conscious lower class would be you're poor you're proud that you're poor you aren't you might want to gain access but you actually want to hold on to your values so kind of like the liberation theology is probably the best you know it's the um, having the values and the culture of the poor is what is the best in kind of liberation theology and you're, you're trying to promote that and you're very aware of classist culture and in terms you know whenever we talked about that grid you're, you're trying to act within kind of your role on that grid in terms of classist culture on our are you valuing, what elements are you valuing, are you valuing subjective, are you valuing those things, it's, it's not a conscious, I, I mean it's not a like, oh I'm going to like be subjective because that's the lower class value, but it's uh, this is our culture, we value this, this class culture, does that make sense? And we're going to identify with this class culture, so I think that, that that's what I'm getting at in terms of of both class consciousness and class identification. So the consciousness is to be aware of your role and to kind of take pride in that role, if that makes sense. So, and to be able to perceive both systems of class and class as culture, if that makes sense. So, and I mean, I probably need to do more slides on the whole class um, consciousness, because I think that that's kind of a, a confusing thing, but if you look at different groups, the groups that are class conscious, the liberation the theologians, that, that's a class conscious group. Pentecostals is not a class conscious group. They, they do identify as poor. They say we're poor, that's great that we're poor, but they aren't observing, they aren't admitting, acknowledging systems of classism um, so much. and. I would say they probably do identify on a cultural level, or they're class aware on a cultural level, but I would say it's more unconscious, if that makes sense. So, all right, I'm going to keep going. Um, but. What, what would you have to say, to say about like environments where the political environment is absolutely acknowledging class consciousness <coughs> and just that's just the way it is. Like I, again, I'm sorry. I think of Colombia, right? Like right. everybody knows that everybody's classes and everybody knows what class they're in, and you could even. You can just find out somebody's last name and know what class they are, or where somebody lives and know what class they are and what they have access to and what they don't have access to. And it's just, and but the political environment is not trying to suppress that because it's like so in the air, like it's just everywhere. So how would you, like, what is that? You know, like when you're just in that environment all the time, right? What does that even mean? Yeah, so I think about it like if you grew up in the South, and, and then I'm going to use a racial analogy. If you grew up in the South, so in the South, race is everywhere. It's very racist. Everyone's going to know that there's race at play. But would you say everyone in the South is race con conscious? And what I mean by that, are they, have, are they able to remove their racial blinders? I would say absolutely not. The black folks are definitely going to be race conscious in most cases, unless, except for the ones that really are the Uncle Tom that have never seen, never even acknowledged that there's been any oppression or racism. Um, but the white folks are going to be colorblind, essentially. They're not going to be class conscious. So... You mean race conscious? Race conscious, sorry. The, the, the white folks in the South aren't going to be race conscious. Um, no, they're not going to know when they're acting white. Right. Because white is normal. There's no other. Yeah, I don't think that translates to class thing. No, I, I, I think part of what I'm getting at is are you, what is your role in the system? Is your role 
an active role. Is there any distinction between class consciousness and being class aware? Like, I know what class I'm in. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Right. Being class aware and being conscious. Yeah. Are you saying, are you saying, like, class consciousness actively fighting? Um, a class of system? Is that what you're saying? I think so. Um, but you're not class conscious, I mean, with the desire to maintain your class. You mean, reverse. Right, that's what I'm saying. It's like, like, every, right, like, that's what I'm saying. It's like, hey. people are, people know, and they know that they need to, like, keep it. Mm -hmm. And they know they can't fight it, you know. Right. So, so that's why I'm confused. Yeah, I, I think you're right that there's a, a big difference. And if you look at whenever I talk about class identity development, I think what I'm, if you go way back to. You know, the one of the things that people who are very, very high class in the U.S. They're very class conscious. They actually say things like, "People in my class don't wear double-breasted suits." Um, things like that. No, they're class aware, I think, is what I'm getting at. So I, I think I need to define my terms a little better, but I think part of what I'm getting at is... Because uh, the folks I know, they work hard to maintain the status quo of class of person in the U.S. And the whole thing right. is that the lower class right. and the middle classes don't think they exist. So. I think part of what I'm getting at is until you hit stage three, you don't hit class consciousness on this. So, yeah, see, I'm. So you hit awareness, but you don't hit consciousness. So you're aware, you're aware that class exists, but you're not. Is consciousness an active? Right, I think, yeah. I think that, that's the part I want to get back to. It's not conscious, it's like active. It's not active, it's not active. Yeah, but there's a way that class consciousness is used. Like it, it has an existing definition in yeah. in the whole community, the, the class community, and I'm trying to approximate that definition. Does that make sense? So in the definition, generally class consciousness is it, it's used in discussions of class. It has to do with this distinction. Does that make sense? Okay. So. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I knew that this is a definition that I hadn't resolved, and this is why I'm presenting this, because better to have, at least they get confused, than I'm at CCDA, and they're like, what are you talking about? Or something like that. So, Lisa's good, because if Lisa's confused, she's not going to go on. She's going to say, I'm confused. Stop. <laughs> you know? so, you're probably all this, this student in the class that always raised your hand. No, I wouldn't. Uh, you weren't. Because of the issues. Exactly right. You're probably the student that wanted to raise your hand. Well, I was the student that went home and cried. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was the professor's Well, I was just crying. This is what I was Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and move on. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move on, but that was a really good point. Um, I think what's important is understanding your role in class reconciliation. Pentecostals are ministry of the poor that fits class culture. Salvation Army is about transferring resources from the upper classes to lower classes, and each of these are needed to address systems of classism. It's just, what is your role? Are you circulating resources within the lower income community? That's kind of what Pentecostals do. Are you Salvation Army? You're taking resources from the up, upper classes to the lower classes. Um, they're transferring those. Are you in black churches where there's a race-centered ministry um, where you're transferring from upper classes to lower classes? If you look at what um, Bruce Wall Ministries does, that's a lot of what they do. You know, a lot of the, the black Christian nonprofits, they're getting grants from the federal government and other things, and they're bringing them to the lower classes. A lot of American liberation theology is political, Christian workers, movements, economic. Can I say one thing? Yeah. When you do this, you 
yeah, it might be useful to generalize those titles. <laughs> to Aptek or something like that? Yeah, like Salvation Army, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you were able to put them up there, like Black Church is that thing. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Yeah. Well, with Black Church, I wasn't sure, is it better to include them or not? Actually, yeah. Uh, yeah, ethnic. Yeah, lower class. Lower class dominant ethnic churches, is that better? Part of the reason why I didn't want to exclude it is I'm trying to catalog. You can use as an example of right. within the U.S. it's a very large category. Right. You know. You know, like even the Center of Salvation Army. Yeah. Even the Salvation Army represents. Yeah, yeah. Right. Got you. Okay. That's cool. Uh, but when you say after church, make sure you sort of say class and urban because they definitely might have black churches that yeah, yeah. Have. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a good point. And part of the reason why I did use the Salvation Army is because not all things that are like the Salvation Army follow that model. Right. The Salvation Army has really strong class identification. I use them because they have strong ident class identification. There are a lot of, cr of Christian nonprofits that don't have strong class identification. Yeah. So, and I use them because of that. So, um, okay. And this is the thing that we're talking about, class consciousness and being apolitical. Let me just present this, and you all can take it or leave it. I understand it's a much longer debate, but I would actually say part of what I've seen people misapplying racial consciousness towards the class issue can actually be damaging. Um, so this is my take on it, and maybe this is wrong, maybe it isn't. But often upper class groups take, uh, will paternalistically judge lower class groups that are apolitical. So this is, I would say, almost all the people who judge Pentecostals um, for being apolitical. Um, and not all Pentecostals are apolitical. Certain areas. Yeah. Um, on social and, yeah, and economic yeah. issues. Okay. So, so there's, there's often this judgment. Um, Which upper class groups are you talking about? Any. Upper class? Any, any. Yeah. Um, do you mean, do you mean, are these upper class groups, in, are they political? Um, any upper class groups. I'm talking judge in terms of, we say you're bad, not like you're actually a judge in a court. No, 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 okay. no, 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 I understand let, that. Let, let me finish and then ask questions once I get done. Okay, because okay. I need to move much more quickly or I'm not going to get anywhere near I need to go. So, um, Harriet. I'll just have one thing. Okay. Well, I may need to have that happen some just to get far enough. So, Harriet, your head's coming on the picture. <laughs> um, so, I would say frequently it's politically unsafe for lower class groups to be political due to extreme opposition. So, um, as I've read Latin American history, that's a lot of the summary of Latin American history, um, where there's just a strong political volatility. Where you know, say, say the Pentecostals did choose to be political, Pentecostals wouldn't exist because every time the government turns over, then you have whatever that other group basically being thrown out. So by being apolitical, the Pentecostals have been able to survive in Latin America um, with having the political system changing frequently. Um, McCarthyism in the U.S. is a, another example. Um, so I think that something that is um, important, I said this before, being political and being class aware often go together. Um, and I think that the reason why class may be different than other racial groups is because if you're lower class, by definition, you have low access and you don't have access to power. So if you gain consciousness, it's not like you're black middle class and you're or you're going to become black middle class and become conscious. It's you're, you're lower class. If you gain consciousness without gaining access, then I would say that that, in my opinion, I, I currently believe that that's not healthy, but that's not helpful. Healthy is probably the wrong word. Helpful it is, I think, that you're hurting hurting folks and, and basically taking a paternalistic upper class view or middle class view um, toward the situation. Um, and I'm talking about class consciousness, not racial consciousness. So 
Um, and I, I think part of what I'm getting at is saying that in order not to take a paternalistic view, you have to respect the lower class group's perspective to determine for themselves whether they want it to be class conscious or not, depending on their unique role. So Pentecostals, given their role, I think they're making the right choice on being not on not being class conscious. As Pentecostals start to move up and gain class access, I think Pentecostals need to become class conscious, or otherwise, in my opinion, they're selling out the gospel. So, um, yeah. So that's the summary on that part. So how do you explain? Unions again? Unions are generally lower middle class to middle class working class people, if that makes sense. And the leaders are, are often the middle class or the upper middle class and the working class. But you have people who gain class consciousness without access? No, they're, they're getting what I'm saying, the middle and upper class. Um, so, okay, so when you talk about access, you're really talking about lower to anywhere else? Yeah, that's probably right. Okay. I'm, I'm talking about at the very bottom. So, okay. lower middle is a different thing. I think if you're lower middle, especially within the workers' movement, you need to have that. You have to have consciousness. So, I'm not saying like middle class or lower middle class. I'm talking about people who are generally in poverty. Um, if that makes sense. So. And I would love to have longer debates. I know Curry and I could probably have a lot of debate on that issue. Because I'm not, I'm not completely convinced, but that's my current conclusion. So. so does that mean that the prescription becomes not to provide class consciousness assistance to the lowest until they gain access? To do it in the educational process. The higher levels of the educational process. Or to do it as a part of the educational process. Because the educational process is also giving them the access. Right. Yeah. Sorry, do you still have a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Good luck. All right. Hi, Dr. Hart. Um, okay, I'm going to move on because I want to get to the other part. <laughs> so, I'm going to explain You said hello, I'm the only one in here who's yeah. had that many questions. <laughs> I think it's the kind of thing that... Well, I, like I said, this stuff was going to be dead, so I, we can't I, I want to try to get through most of it by... Yeah, go through it, we'll read it, and then okay. have a question. All right. So, I'm changing channels and then going to the multi-class church. These were all lower class identified um, groups, and this is being a, a generally multi-class church. Um, and there, the unique role is equality, so ministry with the poor on an equal level. This is what we were talking about yesterday. It requires commitment to do ministry with the poor. Ministry to the poor is in a, in a multi-class church is paternalistic. Um, yeah, we already talked about this yesterday, so I'm not going to keep talking about it. This is the point that Kari was making yesterday about power in a multi-class church. Um, Basically, pastors have to use their power to offset tendencies to class dominate. Um, and I think that the main point of this is if you're going to try to have a multi-class church, if you're going to do that and you're not going to do it well, you should have a giving class church. Because if you're going to say, we're doing a multi-class church model and you got 1% who are lower class or, um, you know, there's no chance of the lower class ever becoming an equal group in leadership, then it's kind of pointless. Um, so being a giving church, there the unique role is resources, giving resources to ministry of and with the poor. You're t trying to take ministries that are identifying with the poor, that previous group that I was looking at, and you're trying to distribute resources to that group. Um, and you're recognizing that, you know, we're in the suburbs, so we aren't going to be able to recruit, or we aren't not even recruit, we aren't ever be able to get the critical mass to have critical mass of um, lower class leadership to offset the cultural tendency in the church. Or you might already have a leadership structure where you have, you know, if 99% of your leaders are upper class, it will be really hard for those lower class folks to, to actually lead within their own culture. Um, so 
I think that the important things are to give control to organizations so you just give money and you can have a relationship but don't use that relationship to only give money to class similar organizations to you, if that makes sense. Um, so, so I think the key issue there is can these groups give money without controlling, you know? You probably laugh. <laughs> but, I mean, one, here's just one example. You take most lower class ministries and they don't and you know like the sites that we, we work with some of the sites we work with I would say are getting to to a high level of access you know like the Boston Herd but a lot of the sites we work with for them to do a monthly newsletter it's just never going to happen you know it's not going to happen for at least quite a while but a lot of churches they won't give to a ministry unless they're receiving a monthly newsletter and they say well if you guys are doing the work you should be able to document it. but if you just look at the organizational elements that it takes to put together a monthly newsletter um, that would be you know a quarter time position in a nonprofit that already the pastors work in two full time jobs you know so like a block and heart or something like that um, so I think that that's just one example um, of kind of requiring things so, you know, well, I mean, it's the same thing with government money. It's kind of like the same issue. That to get government dollars, you need to have so many things in place that it's essentially, if you don't have an intermediate decision that the ministry would have to become not, not spontaneous. Right, exactly. Not of the culture. The, the although, although I feel like, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, yeah. Keep going. Okay. This is just a summary of the whole thing. I think. Um, yeah, I probably should have just talked to this slide, and that was the only one because then I could have got a lot quicker. Um, but I think what's important is to recognize, given your combination of these four things, the class background, identification, access, and consciousness, that kind of defines what your role is. You know, the fact that Pentecostals have low class background, lower class identification, low class access, and low class consciousness, that kind of defines their role. They're a church culturally of the poor. Um, or another way you could put it is their role actually defines these things. If you're trying to be a church culturally of the poor, um, you have to have this. You need to have lower class identification because otherwise you aren't going to be culturally of the poor. Um, low class access, uh, what you're saying is you're saying being culturally of the poor is more important than access. It's what you're saying. And that's why you're letting to have low access. And the class consciousness, I would say, is from this conclusion that I've been saying, is you can only be class conscious if you can afford to. And a lot of um, Pentecostal churches are in environments where they can't afford to. That isn't always true. but um, And I think, like, Kojic's probably... Is Kojic very political, what would you say? No. no. Yeah. Compared to like the suppressed movement. Yeah. Also. Okay. Um, and then Salvation Army, because they have eye access, they have this role of doing ministry with the poor to get the resources to the poorest. Um, and each of those, depending on what the ministry is, I think that defines what what sort of makeup the group needs to have. Does that make sense? This last part I'm going to skip over, but the, the general point of this is Marxists have criticized the church and Pentecostals for being sellouts. The summary of this, if you actually look at the cultural values of the poor and then you compare them to what Marxist values are and what um, Pentecostal values are, the Marxist, basically the, the summary is, and I'm not going to go through all this, um, the summary is that Marxism is the logical conclusion of applying dominant culture values to the situation of the lower class. So if you're going to have a dialogue about the lower class and it's going to be entirely of upper class people, 
kind of like you know the white people deciding what black people are like and you know doing their black studies class that are all by white people studying black people and I feel like that to a certain extent is what the issue is with Marxism so they take all these values objectivity materialism being detached and analytical tools of academia they don't share the cultural values of the lower classes um, and Marxism promises material benefit at the cost of the soul of the culture, which essentially is cultural assimilation into the dominant culture values. And I would say most cultural groups, they would rather not have the material benefit or and keep the culture. Right. And I think that that's the... Yeah, that's a good point. But it depends on how much you're going to have to culturally assimilate. So. But, uh, so I'm not going to go into that because that can take a whole, it can be a whole other discussion. So part of what I want to talk about, and we can have more dialogue on this session, so um, is to talk about what are implications for Mission Tech Mission. One of the things I want to do is I, I definitely want to have ongoing dialogue on on these parts. Um, but and I want to kind of summarize some of the other elements into this part um, from. The previous talk I talked about the common class tensions in ministry, and these are, I would say, the ones that I see most often. Low cost versus high quality. We're trying to save money. I mean, it's, this probably is the biggest one that we deal with. Um, we're trying to save money. If we, we could actually, we now have enough money that we could make everything work smoothly as an organization. We could give everything twice the resources that, that we're currently giving it and everything would work smoothly as an organization. I'm not sure as a steward of those resources that that's the best use of the resources. So we could have a well-oiled machine where we do half the work and we, we do it really well. But whenever I look at how are most of the ministries, what are the values that they're doing? Are they trying to have everything done perfectly and to do half the work. Generally most ministries aren't doing that. To a certain extent that can be a problem because it can become a dysfunction. But to another extent it's recognizing not the value of the ministries that we're serving. So if we're doing everything gold plated and they're struggling to get by, I feel like we've changed our class identification, if that makes sense. Um, and that has been an ongoing tension. Um, but it isn't an excuse to always be frantic, but I think what we need to do is we need to, on each of these, we need to stretch ourselves. So I feel like we do try to stretch our resources farther um, than we would be comfortable with, so to speak. Um, so... So if we're to these, could you... Talk a little bit to what you think currently the predominant value is. Within tech mission? Yeah. I would, Are you just saying there's a tension? I think there's a tension, and I think that often whenever I have conflict with people, this is at the very front of my mind. Like, I'm saying, I'm paying a cost. All of us are paying a cost living in an environment that isn't optimal. Like, whenever we're in the basement of Dorchester Temple, we're wanting to be close to the community and we're paying a cost to be in a non-optimal environment to be closer to the community. Right now, being in the house, we could have, we, we have the money to where we could have spent three or four thousand dollars a month on rent someplace, or, or probably five thousand dollars a month in the office building. We could have gotten a really nice office and right, and then cut a third of our programs or whatever. So we could have done that. Um, we could have, we could choose to have fewer programs. Um, we could choose to, I feel like, do a lot of things to where um, life would be a lot more comfortable. And I think that, you know, people here are, a lot, often people here are, are quicker in their personal lives to make sacrifices and to say, okay, I'm not going to get the, you know, 92-inch TV set or whatever, you know, I'm going to sacrifice and only get the 49-inch TV set or something, you know. <laughs> right. um, but I think part of what we're saying is as a value, 
I feel like what we're trying to do is to say, we need to balance those two things. I feel like to focus on quality, we need to go far enough on quality to be a good steward of the resources so we aren't being counterproductive, you know, like a copy machine or something like that. Or there's other things where, you know, if, if your computer's breaking every two minutes and I'm paying you $100 a day, that's not a good stewardship of the resources. Or like phone systems is another example where I'm convinced that Bruce Wall Ministries, if, if they were able to get the funds, and this is part of the, the, the difficulty, but if they are able to get the funds for a phone system, their pro productivity would probably double in the organization, and then you would be able to get a whole lot more done, or maybe not double, but it would, it would pay itself off within months, you know? So... I feel like there's, I think I'm on four different things, when you say low cost versus high quality, because it feels like there's like a stewardship aspect of financial resources, low cost, high quality, but then there's another dimension of that that's like half-assed versus well done. And there's also the kind of comfort, because... For safety. Yes. Some of the people contrast the low cost with what would be comfortable, which is different than a high quality. Because in a high quality conversation, you say, well, higher quality means higher productivity. And so, but that's the like, best of a concept. Right. But, right. but what I'm saying is, in terms of those values, I feel like the high quality value, from my perspective, and you know, we can have longer discussions on this, I think. I feel like to have things gold-plated, so to speak, that's not, I feel like that's not a good use. Are you talking about like your work? Well, it translates. I pay you $100 a day or whatever it is, and not $100 a day, but something, you know, a decent amount. And if it takes you two days to do something, whatever it could have taken you a day, then we've just doubled the cost. So from a management perspective, I have to look at sure, things sure. through that lens. I hear that. So. I, I do feel like there's a dimension where, because people in certain settings are used to being treated badly, they don't expect you to respond to them in a certain way, and they're used to being this. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like there's a quality aspect to, to that that needs to be high quality because... Right. And I would say, because, you know, because it's not actually good to continue the power that other people have. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I would say I've often seen that used to paternalistically apply middle class values to the lower class of thing. Where I've heard that argument most often is someone from the middle class saying exactly what you said, which is, I'm trying to provide something of quality because, I mean, what I really feel like going, is going on is because that's what I'm comfortable with. Like, what, what I feel like, you look at the communities, the values that the communities have, and how those communities distribute their resources, and I feel like with the ministries, like, we need to be close to the ministries that we're trying to serve, if that makes sense not too far off from that. And I think that if we get too far off from that, then we can say, oh, well, we're providing something that's high quality, which is what they deserve. But honestly, what they would prefer is they prefer that we'd give them more cash and give them, and give them a less quality product. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about products, I'm talking about relationships, and I'm talking about like, how you treat people and how you treat people in well, I mean, and, and to a certain extent, you're right, so that's a, another tension, so relational versus efficient. So, and I feel like while we're at Dorchester Temple, you, you managed that well in that you did lose efficiency because you were choosing the relational value, and that costs money, if that makes sense. I feel like I'm still touching on something different. Okay. It's not relational versus efficient, but let's just move on. Okay. Um, spontaneous versus structured orderly. We could create an organization that is extremely structured, extremely orderly, and oppresses anyone who comes from a spontaneous culture, and that wouldn't be a helpful thing. Um, subjective versus objective, you know, with our funders. So this is part of what I was going to get to. 
for each of these, there's groups that have class tensions. There's the community needs versus the funder needs. There's community needs versus the volunteer needs. So lower class church needs versus the upper middle class church needs. It's community needs versus staff needs versus the resource provider's needs. Does that make sense? And what we have to do is we have to balance all these. So, and why don't I just talk about these different groups, you know, so spontane spontaneous versus structured orderly. Our funders, and I, I probably should create a chart that's giving me an idea. Um, so our funders, uh, our funders want us to be orderly, structured orderly. Our funders want us to be objective. So whenever you're talking about objective versus subjective, they want what are the objective measurements for program evaluation. Um, our ministries, most of our ministries are more subjective. You know, whenever you talk with them, what, what do they care about um, in terms of, you know, what they're doing? They, they care about having made, have I changed someone's life? Um, Stories versus stats. Right. Um, and the same thing with volunteers. Most volunteers want something that's structured. They want something that's reserved. Um, they want something that's efficient. You know, if you waste an hour as a volunteer and you're just sitting around because no one is going to tell you what to do, you're out of there. That's not efficient, you know. Um, but what if it's you're just supposed to be spending relational time, you know, with people? Um, so I think that. For all these groups, there are these tensions, and depending on what our role is, kind of depend, depends on what the balance is in this. And I, I, I want to have extensive discussion with people on these, but I feel like we can take, we can have debates on what's right and what's not based on, you know, ultimately, I feel this. We need to, on, on the point of, of what you're saying, I think is probably the best example. Are we called to give a, a really high quality result to low income communities at a higher cost? Or are, are we called to do a lower cost? And I think that would be yeah, more. And I, I think that fundamentally it gets down to what is our calling? There are groups that I think because of their calling, they have to do what you were proposing. Um, the Salvation Army does. The Salvation Army has to have things that are, I would say, you know, very objective, structured, and, and things along those lines. And I think that has somewhat to do with their calling. So I think that the thing that we need to talk about is, you know, given our calling, given the different groups that we work with and the stakeholders, and staff needs are important. Like, the thing I don't want to do is to say, well, we just need to all suck it up and, you know, we'll work 90 hours a week and we'll do more and we'll have less and we'll have higher quality. Because <laughs> ultimately that's what happens whenever you say, you know, okay, I'm not going to give up on the quality, I'm not going to give up on the cost, I'll just work more, you know, and that. So it's the, Craig, I'm sure you've got this from your business class of the three things you can choose, quality, time, and costs, and you can pick two of the three, or usually you can pick one of the three. Um, so well, now they have a chance of getting time back in the cost. Right. So, but for us, I think our time is often important. Like there's still you're still paying the cost. I think that's the point of that. So. So given that, I thought a little bit about like where is tech mission, how do we fit into these different models, and I think if you look at our backgrounds, we're mixed background. We have some people who are middle class, some people who are low income, some people are lower middle class backgrounds, so we have mixed income. I think what we're trying to do is to say probably have a lower class dominant. Um, where there's more people with lower class backgrounds. Um, in terms of access, one of the, I think, unique roles is, it's a question of who are we? Um, and one of the unique roles is we do have high access. I mean, the fact that we've been able to gain all these government grants, we have a highly educated staff. Um, 
I feel like in terms of what I would want for Tech Mission, I think that we're, you know, doing reasonably well, but I feel like we can grow it in, in this area is lower class identification um, in, in Tech Mission. And then in terms of awareness, I've been debating this one. Um, some of the debate that Curry and I were having over the consciousness. I, actually, this should be consciousness and need just. Yes, sorry. I, I, I changed this in the uh, slides that I gave you, but not in this copy, so it's the consciousness. It's, it's very common. <laughs> Great. That's my yeah. Um, I think the conclusion I'm coming to on that is that our staff would be class conscious, but we wouldn't promote class consciousness necessarily very strongly with our membership because we recognize different groups will come from different traditions that need within AC4 right within AC4 yeah um, so but part of the reason why I think about that on to be determined is it seems like any group that becomes class conscious becomes politically active and if we do that, it, that probably would be making a choice to be m much more politically active um, than we currently are. I think if you put the safe name as an issue of justice. Right, yeah. So, how do people feel about that? Why don't we have some discussion about that? How do people feel in terms of, is that an accurate representation of Tech Commission? Is that where we want to be? Are you there, Mark? I'm here. Did, um, did you still class identification again? Lower class identification is... Um, you say, is that where your heart is? Yeah, why don't I go back to the... I can go back to the slide. Yeah, it, it's who are your people in terms of... Who, who are you standing for? Yeah. Does that make sense? So... You may come from a different background, but you had a different background before, right? What's that? Well, the strong lower class identification means you had a different background before, mm -hmm. right? Here's here's the way I define it: is your it's the primary class identity of those closer to you and those you identify with, the friends, community, and family, and it's possible that this group could be a group of people who have high class access but all of us are class identifying with the poor and because of that this group becomes a self-supporting does that make sense like the friends around you are identifying with the poor does that make sense so this group can count in that context it doesn't have to be people who are who are poor it could be people who are identifying with the poor um, Allocation of resources towards class groups. So that's your money. You know, how's your money being distributed? Is it going, you know, I think both under the question of are you buying a lot of luxuries or are you tithing to churches to put a significant portion of your money to the poor? Um, work. Is probably the biggest resource people have, you know, if you're spending 40 or 60 hours or whatever it's been, I guess not too many people do 60 hours a <laughs> year, but um, a lot of people do in, in, you know, in other jobs, you know, if you're spending 60 hours a week, that's the biggest resource you have to distribute, and if you're doing that, making diamonds for people, you know, that probably isn't directly serving the poor so much, but the work I feel like we're doing here... Um, and then time, which could be, you know, how are you volunteering? How are you um, spending your extra time? Um, and then your accessibility on a class group based on your culture, appearance, language. So how accessible location, like living in a lower income community. Um, and then whether you're, I guess active in addressing classism. Does that answer your question? So. Okay. So, going back to... Yeah. Who are we? I, I think my 
our one concern is that it's very easy for us to be whatever, whatever the personal preferences of the decision makers are, as opposed to we do something because we, we have a conscious choice to do something. Like, if you were to let me decide what technician is, I definitely have a strong bias towards certain things. Right. And it becomes really important for us to do the exercise as an organization or as a community to do shit is whether that's the board or you mm -hmm. so realistically think about what should technician be in the keeping of that mission. Right. Um, so the so the mission defines right. the best, I guess it's what? I guess that's exactly what I'm saying because it's really easy. Mm -hmm. like, even on those kind of intentions, right? What's going to happen without without introspection and evaluation, the decisions will be whatever the person preference of the decision maker. Right. And um, coming to this point is a four year process to shape who we are. So this isn't just I wrote this chart and that became who, who we are. This, Part of what I'm saying, Kari, is you have to recognize that there there hasn't been a process no, involved in that, and no, I guess there there have been these issues kind of hammered out along the way of you know whenever Lisa and I fight out about this tension of quality versus doing a lot of things, we are doing the access tension. Like we have to have this for access and... Well, well but I'm, I'm not saying it hasn't happened. Right. What I'm saying is for you to... When you ask us right. who should we be, I don't know how to answer because mm -hmm. I'm like, well, lower class, high access, strong identification, and strong awareness or consciousness, right? That's me. So are you asking for us to have a debate here or are you asking us to... I mean, I'm talk, talking about kind of a high level discussion. I want to have a much more detailed debate one to one with people. You want one to one. So, so I want to have a high level discussion here. I want to have the fighting it out tooth and nail probably more one to one. I'd rather not do that tooth and nail. Are we are we bring our personal point of view? Are we? I think you have to take it from the perspective of the mission. Okay, that's 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 what I'm right. And what's the mission again? <laughs> the, the mission. No, the, the mission is to support Christian organizations from using technology to transform vulnerable communities. Well, if that's the case, that doesn't matter. Um, now, if you're talking about vulnerable communities, then and you're talking about being culturally close to vulnerable communities. To do that well, there has to be a certain cultural closeness to, to you know, vulnerable All upper class and the Right. And the right. Even if they're lower class identification? Yeah. I would say that. Yes. Okay, so the difference? It would be... Lower class identification is your choice, the background is who you are. Right. Okay. okay. And then you said lower class this technician has to always be dominated by the Um I don't know. I mean, that, that is a debatable point, but... Um, so I'm just going down the list. Right, right, right. So... This is good. Like, that would be whack in the sense that... Wouldn't you want to just take the godly aspect of all the current classes? Or try to make a hodgepodge of that somehow? No. And I think that's the point that I'm trying to make. There's two approaches to determining mission. One is to take, I would say that, is to take each of our individual, who are we each individually, and let's just add that up, and then that's what we get here. And, and what I'm saying is that isn't the approach here. The approach is mission-driven. We, we have a mission. I feel like God has called us collectively as an entity to a specific mission, and that needs to drive needs to drive the... No, I, I understand that part. So, so like, if, if, if we say God had called us to be Pentecostals, or the Pentecostal movement, I think, and if, if we had a unique mission that's like the Pentecostal movement, 
that I would say not only do you have to have background mixed with lower class dominant, it would actually have to be lower class background. You understand what I'm saying? I understand what you're saying, but all I'm saying is that whatever, whatever that mission is, whatever our mission is, I just, I guess, I guess I'm wrong. You would just try to look at that mission and look at the different things that are available to you and all these different things, or depending on, you know, whatever attributes you're looking at, and then try to figure out what what would serve that mission given what's probably and what's available? So that, that's true. I have a question, but... When we're talking about background, are we talking about technicians' values, or are we talking about who's in general? Yeah, like who are we talking to in leadership? Because when I see mixed and lower class dominant, I was saying that like Andrew, when you retire, the next executive director needs to be a lower class background or senior leadership to be lower class background? Or are we saying that we will value as an organization um, lower class culture and lower class culture is not the culture that we ascribe to? Because I think background looks different but than the individual that I think that position. both of those are somewhat the same. I think that we're trying to value lower class culture, but I think to do that, well, background is helpful. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if, if, if you did become all upper class, then you couldn't do that well, is part of what I'm saying. So, and I don't know, I mean, maybe it's too strong to say mixed with lower class dominant. Um, this is a, a first pass and I, you know, this is a part of my introverted nature. I, I go and I introvert and I kind of design things and then people say, ooh, it's on paper, shoot, it's already fixed. You know? I, I want to have dialogue on this. Yeah. Right. I, I'm just, for me, I'm just trying to understand what it means. I know what it means for a person to have. So as an organization, I think what I am saying is both in terms of the culture and the staff makeup. So I feel like in terms of staff makeup, I'm conscious of creating a balance across race, class, and gender in terms of achieving our mission that we want to achieve. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I feel like whenever I look at our mission, our mission is focused on vulnerable communities. Um, whenever you look at the lack of access to technology, it is an issue across race, class, and gender. Unless you reach across those and have have some balance to help address that, then you could perpetuate the issues. Do you know what I'm saying? No. Yeah. So, so I think that that's part of why I'm saying it. I think part of what I'm proposing, this is maybe more controversial, is long-term class may be the most significant variable, but I don't want to get, go into that debate, but um, that, that is a possibility. If you look at technology, what's going to be the most significant factor around um, technology? Yeah, and so, but uh, but I don't want to get into that because then we start to get into our force and stuff, so, um, but I think that to do that well, you have to make race, class, and gender all priorities, if that makes sense. So. Maura, do you have any thoughts? I want to break in with uh, a few bits and pieces of what other people are saying. I can hear you clearly, but other people I can't hear you well, so I'm not sure what the whole conversation is. Okay, well, throw in whatever thoughts you have, and if you, they're ir irrelevant, we'll <laughs> tell you someone already said that if you want, but... Uh, if, they, if they come up, I'll, I'll definitely just throw in. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I have a couple This is a, a final point. This is a starting point. But whenever I try to think about... What, what was helpful for me is to think about what is our role and how does that relate to the roles of these other organizations? What are the organizations that we're closest to? 
And I think, Ray, I don't know, are we trying to do a new thing? Are there reasons why there aren't, you know, whenever I think of, yeah, I think that there may be reasons why there aren't certain combinations of those things in organizations. Um, is it possible to, to be function like the Salvation Army where you're transferring resources and be highly class conscious? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? So. Do we have, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, why don't I do that? Okay, sorry. Okay, so. Yeah, class goals. Okay, so this, this probably is much better to talk about. Because I think what this does is get to what Lisa was trying to get to, which is... I know how you say that because I know what I was saying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what I understood through Lisa's words on background was to maximize the resources... You know, like, can some other woman please say something? I feel like Meg is self-conscious to be the only girl talking. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> The, the background section, then other people can throw in their words. So the background section is to maximize the resources that are delivered in the class slash cultural level of the community. So we're trying to maximize the resources, but the resources being delivered at the cultural level of the community, not delivered in the culture, upper class culture, but you know our sites generally are pretty close to the community culturally. So we're trying to maximize the resources that we can do. How do what do people feel about that in terms of a way? How does that relate to the background? How that relates to the background? Yeah. If you have all lower class folks, you aren't going to get maximized resources. If you have all upper class folks, you aren't going to deliver them in the class slash cultural level of the community. So what you're saying is that it makes background the option for the resources. Right. I like, I like the hard goal. Is that right? Is it still hard goal? The hard goal is we specifically are trying to maximize the number of resources, but it has to be delivered in the particular way. Christine and Jessica. So you all have been quite, do you have any thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. Yes, Risa. Mm -hmm. right now, maybe on some of the other slides, but... Can I just ask, for, for, for those, I'm not trying to be ageist here, but is some of this so new to think about that it's just hard to even know what to even ask? Yeah, like some of it, I'm still just trying to process. So, I've so kept up with the dialogue. That's why they're in advanced Martian geology. There are lots of opinions about it. I'm, I'm just, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth or grab or something. But I'm wondering if that's what is happening. I don't think it's very new for me, but I think in conversation, like in a large group like this, I take a long time to process what I know, yeah. what everybody okay. else is saying. Mm -hmm. And then I also try to think about, well, if I say this now, will that be helpful to people? And if it, I think it won't be, then like, oh, I'll say this later. But and stuff like that, so it's hard yeah. to know what okay. my faith is and what I'm trying to say. Okay. Yeah. I also feel like, just so you know, I just feel like I've hit my limit and I can't process anymore. Your brain is full. I'm like, okay. I have a really hard time yeah. with anything. We're, we're very close to being done. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your brain is full. Okay. I'm trying to stay around. I mean, we can have a much longer conversation, on, 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 this longer conversation on, on, on this whole slide. Um, right. But it's good to know where people are. Um, and you know, maybe we should revisit some of these slides since this is kind of the conclusion of much stuff. Um, do Teresa or Mara, do you guys have any thoughts? I think it comes from me. I've had a lot of 
lot of personal level questions, um, you know, for me I'm coming from an upper class background and, um, you know, I've had a lot of good conversations with folks, you know, on the team there about my health, you know, my background fits in, um, and, and yet I've also had to walk through quite a bit of, of uh, figuring out how to even process it or talk about it or feel anything other than sort of cheap for coming into um, a place where you know, the, the state is supposed to feel lower class and, and I just kind of felt that time to like hide uh, my background and that sort of thing. And I was talking about this with you guys. That, that a lot of, I just have a lot of very personal questions about um, I think the class articulation needs a technician, and that's why it's something that I'm looking forward to hearing more about. And, and it's just hard to have a conversation where I can't see anybody, so um, that's awesome. Next week we'll have the video conference. <laughs> All right. That'll be good. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, it is worth stating. I think you're probably stating what a lot of people are feeling and talking about class or whether it's talking about race. I mean, talking about race, it makes the white people feel uncomfortable. Talking about class, it can make the middle and upper class people. So I first want to say I apologize if there's ways that I've, like, you know, done that. And I think it may be helpful for people to have a space to process you know, among each other, but also the process with me or process with other staff um, individually, because I know this can bring up. I mean, the, the, the constant question I see happening for people, people, you know, word it in terms of, what do you mean by that, or what, what do you mean by that? But I think it's often, what does that mean for me? <laughs> you know, it's the question that's going through everyone's mind. And, right, and how does this fit into me? And I think that a lot of this stuff can be very personal. Um, and I'm recognizing that this is probably bringing up a lot of stuff that needs to be discussed, and I don't want to leave it, leave people feeling in shame, and then a year later you say, you know, actually I've been feeling shameful ever since that presentation, you know. <laughs> or I, I felt like we can't even have a class dog, because there, there could be things in here that I'm, I'm pointing that are completely unreasonable from my class, you know, like saying, Lower class dominant. Maybe that's just because that would be unfair or something. You know, I don't know. Or maybe it has to do with the mission. Um, I think this is probably a better way of of presenting it. So, any other thoughts people have? I would just encourage people to not necessarily just review it with, with each other. Um, I can't talk about this organization without talking about it personally. Right. Yeah. And I don't think you can do that. You know where you are. So, uh, you know, I thought about some of these things. You brought some things up I hadn't thought of. But, you know, it's, it's not coming out of a total influence. But I think uh, it's really important for us to sort of know each other. And each other. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we see each other's ethnicity and each other's race. Right. And, uh, and gender. So there's not a lot of questions about that. It's an age. But this is, this is a challenge. So I think that maybe there needs to be some offline right. and processing. And I think it is helpful to have conversations both with people who you may have similarities with and people who the other. So like I've noticed, you know, there's conversations that Angel and I will have about race. And there's conversations, like Maura and I have had conversations about race where we're like, whew, whenever you're feeling this, isn't that hard? Or whatever, you know? And, and then Maura's like, yeah. And then I'm like, I feel much better after that, you know, but I couldn't say that. Angel. Yeah, to Angel, because she's like, no. <laughs> I, I don't feel that, you know. <laughs> so, so, recognize that both of those are valuable, and it, it's not like, I think that we respect that enough that we aren't going to be... Yeah, freaking out if people have those conversations. So, um, you guys run. Okay. All right. I'll do these last two. So, either tomorrow or um, Thursday, I'll finish. So, I'll leave these last two for whenever people have. Can you change the words? Yeah, I'll change the words. Because. Yeah. 
I'm sorry. I know that for you it's not a big deal, but it's, it's you. so yeah, yeah. convenient for me that it makes it very helpful. Okay. I'll send you.